Merry Christmas. If you're confused by that, Jesus Christ is Lord 365 days out of the year, so Merry Christmas. Plus, it's saying this time of the year, it really confuses atheists and opens up maybe a dialogue for us, so or they just go away thinking we're as crazy as they thought we were. Hey, is everyone who is here who wants a seat, I said that terrible, everyone who is here, no, that's not it either, uh, is there anybody here that didn't get a seat? So everybody who is here who wants a seat has a seat. Okay, great. We'll just keep doing this one service as long as that is the case. Praise the Lord. Okay, so we're picking up in our series, guys. We're going to be looking at this in two parts, at least in this sermon that Peter delivered on the day of Pentecost. We're going to look at this in two parts, okay? And today I want us to just remember a little bit what we talked about last week, and that was this. There were crowds gathered in Jerusalem in that first century. The crowds normally would be 25,000 people in Jerusalem at the time of one of the three feasts. We find that at this time it could have been 100,000. Scholars suggest even as many as 200,000 people gathered from around the then known world. And they were gathered there to celebrate the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of the Harvest, what we call Pentecost. And it was in that moment that we, there was this amazing sound that happened. The Bible tells us it was a sound of like a violent wind. Perhaps we can envision the sound of a tornado, a freight train blowing through. Whether, whether it was that sound that grabbed the attention of the crowds or the sound that followed grabbed their attention, we don't know for sure, but we know that the crowds were like, what is going on here? The crowds were gathering around because the disciples of Jesus, who were gathered in the upper room, waiting for the promise that Jesus said was coming, had suddenly begun to speak in a variety of different languages. It says that they began to speak and people were hearing them proclaim the wonders of God in their native tongue. We looked at last week, that could have been 20, 30 or more languages being broadcast by approximately 120 people. That would gather some attention, wouldn't it? Now, whether the disciples spilled out of the upper room into the streets and towards the temple, we don't know. But we know huge crowds gathered around and they were all asking, what does this mean? What does it mean? What is this about? And so as they gathered, Peter stood up and began to deliver one of the first ever Christian sermons. Let's prepare our hearts to receive what God's Word has to say to us. We're going to spend some time in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to open your word. Thank you for the opportunity to, first of all, think about and relive what happened in the first century, but most of all, to receive, Holy Spirit, what you're doing in our century, in our time. Help us to receive, in Jesus' name, amen. Acts chapter 2, verse 14. Acts chapter 2, verse 14. And God's word says this. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams, even on my servants, both men and... Thank you. I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death 
by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. And Peter stood up. Peter stood up. Let's unpack this together. Peter stands up and delivers what we call the first church sermon. We do that because scholars recognize it was on the day of Pentecost with the arrival of the Holy Spirit that the church Jesus said he was going to build began. That's not that to say that God was not working throughout all human history. It's to say that something significant was happening. Something that God said was going to occur. So Peter stood up And I think we need to maybe pause and think of this for a moment. God is in the transformation business. And business is good. Peter! We're talking about Peter here, folks. One of the most amazing people for a lot of reasons. But one, because I can relate to Peter a lot before the Holy Spirit came on him. What do we find? We find before the Holy Spirit came in power, he was hiding and he was fearful for his life. And suddenly now, he's become a bold proclaimer. Peter, who was denying that he even knew who Jesus was, now he's loudly declaring his name. He even says, and you people put him to death. Do you understand how bold that is, guys? Allow me to share with you tactically what was happening from a law enforcement perspective, since I am a police chaplain. Allow me to share with you that Peter stood perhaps within a crowd of 75,000. Scholars scholars tell us that around the Temple Mount area, you can fit about 75,000 people in that area. And to stand up and to say something against a crowd of that size is incredibly foolish. There is no tactical way out. You're done for if they turn on you. So Peter stands up in this crowd, some of which who were there. Remember, this is like 50 days after the crucifixion. You get that, right? 50 days after Jesus rose and spent some time with them over a 40-day period. We're now at the day of Pentecost. There were people there in this crowd that were yelling, crucify Jesus, crucify him, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. Kill this one. Now they're in the crowd and Peter's saying, and you people. Wow, that's pretty bold. So was Peter who was cowering at one point in the upper room, John tells us, with the doors locked. He's shivering and shaking and teeth chattering, afraid that they're going to come get him. Now, all of a sudden, he is publicly preaching the gospel. What what transforms a person in such a way? What, What transpired that he can go from timid, at times cowardly and brash, yet outspoken and sometimes putting his foot in his mouth, to all of a sudden standing up before any number of people and saying, here's the facts, folks. Wow. As I read about this, I realize that God is in the transformation business, and if people are willing, business is good. So as we unpack this, we realize that's an important point. But I want you to realize that he is, in fact, delivering a sermon. Now, listen, Bible scholars argue as to whether we're getting the whole sermon. I highly doubt it. I believe we're being given what we need to know about what Peter said, okay? And in this first part, we realize that Peter is dealing with a couple things. First, he stands up and he deals with the hecklers first. There's always a few hecklers in the room, you know what I mean? There's always someone. And some people in the crowd were saying, Oh, listen to these drunkards. They're just babbling at the mouth. They've just been drinking too much at this feast. So Peter stands up and he deals with them. And he says what I believe to be a very humorous thing, okay? I know we read it and it's the Bible. We get so holy and sanctified in our presentation of the righteous scriptures. And that is holy. It is righteous. But sometimes we miss the humor. How does Peter deal with the hecklers? Well, let me try to use some modern language for you. So Peter stands up and he says, Listen, I haven't had enough time to drink to get drunk. It's only 9 a.m. Listen, I barely even had breakfast yet. And you're telling me I'm drunk? Maybe tonight, but not now. Of course, drunkenness is not a good thing, and the Bible speaks against that. So if we realize that, he suddenly says that, and then he just dismisses them. He says, okay, I'll address your idiot remarks. Now let's move on. Oh, excuse me, I forgot. I'm a kinder, gentler minister. Not idiot remarks. Your unthoughtful comments at this moment. Is that better? Remember, when people cut you off in traffic, they're not idiots, right? They're just not thoughtful. So as Peter stands up, he begins to deal with it, and then he quickly begins to explain to them what has happened and why. So let's look at this. Prophecy foretold this event. 
prophecy foretold this event. The Word of God predicted and proclaimed that this was going to happen long ago by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. I love that. God's set purpose and foreknowledge. See, I have a high view of God. I believe that God is fully and completely sovereign. And He is more amazing because He gives us free will. How that works is astounding to me. That God has decided that you will have real choices in life, not fake choices, nor are you a robot. God doesn't make those choices for you. But know this, no matter what choice you make, God will accomplish what He set out to accomplish. Isn't that remarkable? Isn't that a high view of the sovereignty of God? So he said that literally God had a purpose throughout human history. He was going to accomplish it, and he was going to do it by his foreknowledge, which simply means he knows what you're going to do. (laughs) Listen, if I could sit down and play chess with you, and I know every move you're going to do, I can assure you I will always win, okay? It's sort of like me sitting down against Gary Kasparov, one of the world champions, who is one of the longest-running world champions in chess there is. I can give you a high degree of certainty that I can never beat him. Even if he was drunk, I could never beat him. So it's fascinating to me that this is an amazing view of God's sovereignty, that he has given humanity real choices to make. Will you serve God or will you serve yourself? Will you receive God or will you reject him? Will you come to the cross of Jesus Christ or will you avoid it? He gives us real choices to make. And then he says, oh, by the way, you will be held accountable for the choices you make. But you're free to receive or reject. It's remarkable. So prophecy, there's so much confusing about confusion about prophecy. So let's just do this. I'm going to show you just two ways in which prophecy functioned biblically, and particularly now. Prophecy has two elements, okay? The one we most of us know about and get real excited about, it's called foretelling. Or if you prefer, future telling, right? It is the predictive nature, prophecy. But did you know one scholar suggested that the prophetic Prophecy, foretelling elements, is about less than 6% of the biblical message. Yet, what do we find? We get super excited about that small measure of the Bible, right? We get really fired up because it told us in advance what was going to happen, and we're amazed. We're like, Nostradamus is nothing on the Bible. The Bible's amazing. Well, as exciting as that is, the majority of the message of prophecy comes into the second category. The second category is what we call forth-telling telling forth God's will in the here and the now, proclaiming what was, is, and yes, going to be. That is one of the most important elements. In fact, most scholars suggest to us that today, one of the most prophetic elements alive in the church today is preaching. Not because it's future telling, but because it's forth telling. It's telling forth to all people, to anyone, the facts of the gospel and what one must do to be saved. And so with those two elements, I want to share with you an interesting little account, and perhaps, I don't know if you remember this, as I was studying, I had forgotten about this. Everyone remember Moses, right? Raise your hand if you know who Moses is, and generally what, okay, good, that's good, most of you. So Moses, a long, 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 long time ago, we're talking before Nickelodeon, before CNN, before Fox News, before cable TV, before cell phones, before, a long time ago, you know, way back when, about 3,400 years ago to be precise. Moses had an interesting thing happen. Moses was a prophet of God. In other words, the Spirit of God came on him temporarily so that he can teach and preach and so forth. So a thing happened. All of a sudden, the Spirit of God came on the 70 elders that he had brought together. Well, of these 70 elders, I want to share with you something that happened. They began to prophesy. And so suddenly people were jealous about this and they ran to Moses and they said, these people are prophesying and two people are still prophesying. Isn't that your job? Aren't you the prophet? And even Joshua, the great Joshua, said, stop them. You're going to lose your job, in essence, I wonder if he was saying. You're you're not going to be a prophet no more. If everybody can prophesy, it's not very important anymore, is it? Oh, contraire. Listen to what Moses said. I'm going to share this with you. This is way back. Uh, This is found, if you're taking notes, it's found in Numbers chapter 11, verse 29. It says this. But Moses replied, are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put His Spirit on all of them. And God said, okay, okay, I'll do that. 
And the Bible promised time and time again in the Old Testament that this day was coming. A day was coming when the Holy Spirit would rest on all of His people and dwell with them and not go away but stay with us. A day was coming when the Holy Spirit would empower people. And Peter stands up in this sermon, he's saying, that day is now. And if you ever wondered whether we're living in the end times or the last times, he flat out just declared to us, if you were curious about that, we are most definitely in the last days. And it was Peter who once told us, listen, a day unto the Lord is like a thousand years. So it's been like two days since the cross from a biblical perspective. I know we get anxious. And so we live in the last days, and the long-promised outpouring of the Holy Spirit came. God's Spirit to mark the beginning of the end, to fulfill everything that God has declared. And so as we look at this, I know sometimes we miss it, but listen to these words again. In the last days, God speaking, in the last days I will pour out my Spirit on all people, on my servants, both men and women. Time will not allow me this morning, nor is it necessarily a fruitful time because our passage is not on this topic per se, but I think it's worthwhile to note how absurd it is to declare that women do not have a spirit-empowered role within the church of God because God's word declared long ago that women, just as men, will be actively involved in the ministries of the church and the ministry of God and will receive the power of the Holy Spirit just the same as men. In fact, that God makes no distinction that men and women are both made in the image of God and both receive the empowering work of the Holy Spirit. End sidebar, back to the main message. So he says in the last days he's going to pour out his spirit on everybody. I wonder. We realize that he's going to say Jew or Gentile. Not going to make a distinction. Slave or free. Both of them are spirit empowered. Young or old. Oftentimes we feel that Our old dignified saints get to a certain age and they can't be good for anything but just giving money. We'll let them continue to give money, but we won't give them a role in the church ministry. They're just too old. Nonsense. The Holy Spirit says, ah, sorry. How old was Moses when he began his ministry? Oh, I'd say he was a pretty old, ripe fellow. How old was Joshua up until the end? Study your scriptures and you realize even after the fall, the elderly have a role to play in God's mission. In other words, be careful on your interpretation of retirement. You ain't done until God says you're done. So male or female, rich or poor. So as we begin to unpack this, the Bible says that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord might be possibly in a rare chance be saved. Is that what it says? Everyone who calls on the Lord with enough tears and enough emotional involvement and maybe ecstatically says the right things will consider saving this person. If a person calls on the name of the Lord and they belong to the right Republican Party or Democratic Party or Independent Party, we might save them. Or if they switch parties because this one's more holier than the other one, we might. It says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Doesn't matter. No, no distinction. No separation. Every tribe, every tongue, all people groups. You are literally part of one of the most amazing rescue missions of all time because it excludes no one. The only one ultimately excluded from the gospel, you ready for this, are those who reject it. That's astounding to me. That if anyone is willing to repent, that is to turn and receive God's forgiveness, guess what? They'll have it. But all the stubbornness and the arrogance of the heart of man. Oh, how wise and smart we've become. Oh, I don't need Jesus. I don't need organized religion. I don't need church. I don't need a Bible. Because I've got it all figured out. That will not play well on Judgment Day in case anyone in this room is falling into that error. I was once there. But as the old hymn says, I was once blind, but now I see. I still need glasses when I read, but I can see. So as we come to this passage, it's the first sermon ever delivered, the quote-unquote church sermon. And Peter stands up and he proclaims the gospel. I mean, look at the facts he lays out there. Just as a, a matter of fact, gee whiz, check it out. He says, we're going to talk about the life of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, and oh yeah, everyone, anyone, any person, whomsoever can call on the name of the Lord and be saved. This is a remarkable point that that, that the scripture tells us. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord can be saved because of what Jesus did. One of the things that marks out, quote unquote, Christianity from all other world religions, 
Tim Keller puts it this way. All world religions suggest that man has to earn their way to God. They have to be good enough. They have to do the right things. They have to do a certain number of good works or good deeds. All of them. It's like climbing a ladder to heaven and they have to struggle and sweat and maybe they'll make it. That's not Christianity. Christianity remarkably says this. Jesus Christ came to us and he put the ladder up and oh yeah, he is the ladder. And that he came to us and saved us and now we climb in joy. We climb in grace. We ascend to the presence of God because Jesus did the hard work, not us. My, isn't that an amazing, compelling view of what Jesus did for us? Because see, the world is often confused. They think our message of Christianity is come in, dress, Hawaiian shirt is most appropriate, dress in the right clothes, attend the right church on the right day with the right sign outside, make sure that you go to the right kind of preaching with the right kind of book and following the right kind of rules, and just maybe, maybe you'll be saved. Nonsense. We have but one message. It's Jesus. Jesus did it for us. So that means our response can be joyful because we're not trying to earn anything. It's already been done. So Peter stands up and the first sermon ever delivered has the same elements of every sermon we still preach today. We are saved through Jesus. It's remarkable. So we get to this reality and it actually begs a question, doesn't it? Whether you're watching this on YouTube or in the room this day, it begs the question. And the question is quite simply, have you called upon the name of the Lord? Have you come to that moment where like Peter, you've stood up and said, you know what, I'm taking my stand. I've looked through all the different things of the world. I've studied everything I can study. And I know I've come to the truth. And that truth is Jesus. You see an amazing thing about Peter. He didn't stand up alone. Did you know that? The 11 stood with them. They didn't speak. They let Peter do all the speaking, just like y'all. Y'all don't come up here. You force me to come up here and make a fool of myself. So I do it on your behalf for the Lord Jesus. You know, they let Peter do the speaking, but he didn't stand alone, did he? All 11 stood with him. All of them. And not only that, every Christian who has believed on Jesus Christ since stands with you when you take your stand. You don't stand alone. Just today, they suggest to us there's over 2 billion followers of Jesus Christ, those who pronounce the name of Jesus. That means when you take your stand for Jesus today, you don't stand alone. And as if 2 billion is an impressive number, it's not big enough because it also includes every generation of followers of Jesus Christ who came before now. That means when you stand, a huge crowd stands with you. Isn't that remarkable? You don't stand alone. So as we come to this reality, I'm reminded of John Newton as I was studying this week. Uh, Raise your hand if you know who John Newton is. Not Wayne Newton, the country fellow. John Newton, like three of you. Okay, you'll know more when I explain a little bit. So I got a quote from him, but I want you to really have a little of his background. So John Newton was a pretty amazing person. He started out in a pretty inauspicious way. He was a slave trader on a slave ship. Anyone know who he is now? He uh, was a slave trader on a slave uh, business uh, ship and trading people as if they were property, treating them very horribly as if they were inhuman just because of the color of their skin. He came to be converted. converted. In other words, he stood up and he took his stand for Jesus. He came to know that Jesus was real and he gave his life to Jesus. And in his book, one of the first and only books against slavery back in that day, He stood up and he wrote a book and he said that he was so ashamed and still ashamed that he still did not stop slavery. He continued to practice even after he'd come to Christ like so many of the millions of people alive that day. It was just too inconvenient of a topic to stand against. So he continued and continued until finally he felt the call of God. He left that industry and he went into preaching and teaching and became a pastor. And so popular was his preaching and so amazing was his account that people would come from everywhere. At one point he was in London. And in London, he'd become known for helping people who struggle with their faith. They're not sure what they believe or where they really should believe, and they have doubts. He became famous for helping people to discover what they believe and why. People would come to him privately. And one person came to him by the name of William Wilberforce. Do you know his name? William Wilberforce came to him, and he was a political guy. He was in, you know, government council, kind of parliament, kind of a thing of Europe. I don't understand their system. I won't bother to try. And uh, he was in politics. And he was certainly crushed and overwhelmed and tired and run out. And so he'd come 
to John Newton. He says, oh, tell me what I believe and encourage me. I need to find a different calling. I need to find Christ's calling. I need to find something more moving, something more impactful, something more gospel-oriented. I'm thinking about leaving and quitting this whole politics stuff because politics, you know, that's nothing. Now, obviously, I'm paraphrasing. But John Newton answers him in an interesting way. No, you serve God where he's placed you, and you serve him well. You, in essence, he was saying to him, you bloom where you're planted. Now, here's what's remarkable. William Wilberforce, up to that moment, had not taken on slavery. He spent the rest of his political career taking on slavery. And just after he died, of course, or just prior to it in days, if you will, slavery was banned throughout Europe. Now think of all of this. That's just amazing. And John Newton, in case you didn't know, he's probably more well-known today by some of the hymns he produced. One of the hymns you would not recognize the title unless we use the contemporary title. It includes the words from the first line, and it's entitled Amazing Grace. Now you know who he is. I want to share with you a quote. This is something he said about those who either take a stand for Jesus or refuse and ignore him. John Newton once said this, when I get to heaven, I shall see three wonders there. The first wonder will be to see many people there whom I did not expect to see. <laughs> How did you get in here? Boy, if you got in. The second wonder will be to miss many people whom I did expect to see. I can't believe our pastor's not here. The third and greatest wonder of all will be to find myself there. Have you taken your stand for Jesus Christ? Because at the end of your life, you're going to find that it will be the most meaningful decision you ever make or neglect to make. I can assure you that with certainty today, that it will be the most meaningful decision you make or reject. All the other stuff will be irrelevant. How much money you made, how many cars you owned, how many houses you had, how many vacation days they gave you at work, all of that stuff will be absolutely, positively irrelevant when you stand before God. So I urge you today, if you have not done so, take your stand for Jesus. It's not complicated. You say, yes, Jesus, I will follow you. Show me how. Amen. And there'll be plenty of us that'll come alongside you and help you figure out the rest. So I want to share with you a little cool uh, poem of worship, you, if you will. It's not a Dr. Seuss poem, so don't get upset if there's no rhyming. But it was a poem inspired by our passage of Scripture. It even includes verse 24. Are you ready for a poem? Maybe if I told you this is the last thing I'm going to say, you'd be a little more excited. Are you ready for a poem? Yeah. Uh, all right, that's some encouragement. Here it is. His name is above all names. God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. His name is above all names. At his name, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. His name is above all names. At the mention of his name, demons tremble and angels cheer. His name is is above all names. Death couldn't hold him. The grave couldn't contain him. And the devil can't defeat him. His name is above all names. For his name is Jesus. Father, thank you for this time to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to be reminded that the gospel isn't us earning your love, that you've already granted it freely on the cross. Lord, I pray for anyone here that maybe, stunningly, amazingly, have never actually taken a stand for you and are considering it. I pray, Holy Spirit, you would draw them in power, that they would know this is the time, this is the moment to respond to you, Lord. As I reflect over my life and the changes you've made, I am just stunned where you've brought me. And I know there's so many of us here in this group that would agree. Lord, you are the God of all grace, and you have grace and love for us. Teach us to respond more and more day by day to continue to take our stand Peter took his stand in his generation and his time. Lord, help us to take our stand in our generation and in the time you put us in. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.